let me welcome you all here on this first day of spring with its snowstorm. Uh, I'm uh, Bob Newton. I'm a special assistant. I'm a special assistant to the president of Boston College, Father Leahy, and I'm the interim director of the church in the 21st Century Center. <clears throat> um, just there are a few uh, new faces here, and uh, I think most of you probably have some idea what the church in the 21st Century Center is. It was founded about eight years ago in the midst of the clerical sexual abuse crisis at uh, here in, you know, the epicenter seemed to be here in the Archdiocese of Boston. It was Father Leahy's uh, response to what should a Catholic college do in the, in the middle of all of these troubles the church was facing. And so for the past eight years, uh, we've developed, I think, a very robust center. If you go to our website, you'll see uh, the, all the things that are on there that, that uh, are of assistance to the Catholic community. Uh, we focus on four issues, handing on the faith, roles and relationships in the church, uh, the Catholic intellectual tradition, and let's see if I can remember the fourth, uh, the sex sexuality and the Catholic tradition, yes. How could I forget that as a good Catholic, <laughs> sexuality and the Catholic tradition. Um, <laughs> Amazing, isn't it, that I, I've been at it for eight years and I still can't get the four now. Uh, but uh, t t this year, the, uh, the theme has been a grace and commitment, and we focused on, in the first semester on the vocations of the laity. This semester, we focused on the vocations of the ordained and of religious. And uh, I think t tonight you'll see that uh, we have one of the world's great experts to speak to us about uh, what goes on in seminaries, uh, training the ordained. But my, that's, that's all I'm going to say other than to introduce one of my favorite, of course, everyone's favorite uh, people, uh, Dick Clifford, the uh, long time, I think 41 years, <coughs> teaching at the Weston Jesuit School of Theology, now here at the School of Theology and Ministry at BC. He was the founding dean of our School of Theology and Ministry, and he gave a terrific uh, talk, which you can find on our website, uh, about vocation in the Old Testament about three weeks ago. I'm pretty sure it's up already. So let me introduce Dick Clifford. Thank you, uh, Bob. And let me add my <clears throat> welcome to everyone here. Uh, to this very distinguished uh, lecture this evening. One I think that's relevant, and uh, uh, we were in the hands of someone who really knows the scene. Sister Katerina Schuth has been a member of the Sisters of St. Francis, Rochester, Minnesota, since 1960. Since in, in 1991, she accepted an endowed professorship for the social scientific study of religion at the St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Educated in both the social sciences and theology, she has a PhD in cultural geography from Syracuse University, and we are happy to say she has a Master of Theological Studies degree and a licentiate in theology from Western Jesuit School of Theology, now part of the new STM. Uh, she has, uh, in addition to being having a degree, she also worked in the administration. She worked as a registrar and also in development, in both of uh, which jobs she excelled. As a researcher and teacher, her primary interests are theological education, church ministry, and the relationship between church and culture. She has a number of books, and I'm just going to give you a couple. Uh, Seminaries, Theologates, and the Future of Church Ministry, An Analysis of Trends and Transitions, 1999, Reasons for the Hope, for the, hope the Futures of Roman Catholic Theologates, which she wrote while she was at uh, Western Jesuit and a co-authored book, uh, Educating Leaders for Ministry, in 2005. And the most recent one is actually one on pr parish priests, uh, priestly ministry in multiple parishes. She is a widely consulted authority on the education of priests. She's spoken frequently in the United States and also internationally, Rome and the UK, among other places, on, at workshops and conferences on a variety of issues that are relevant, but particularly the priest shortage, the future of Catholic ministry, trends related to seminaries and schools of theology, 
and the clergy sex abuse uh, crisis on which he has worked closely with the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And there'll be uh, something in, that, in the talk about that. Uh, Sister Katerina teaches pastoral ministry, sociology of religion and world religions at, uh, in St. Thomas. And she has served on more than a dozen board, boards of directors and trustees, including 16 years at Western Jesuit. You can see I'm kind of pushing a theme here. <laughs> Uh, she, was, she has been the recipient of many honorary degrees and awards, uh, including the Pedro Urupe Award for Excellence in Ministry at Weston. <laughs> and uh, in, uh, in the interest of brevity, I'll just say two more things. That she, has, she has a doctor of an honorary degree from Boston College in 2004. So, and then she is also, and I think this is very significant, the National Federation of Priest Councils in 2009 gave her the Mandatum Award, which I think is an indication of how well she knows the diocesan world and the world of priests. It's wonderful to welcome an old friend and someone who is so competent in the area, Sister Katerina. Thank you so much, Father Clifford. Uh, friend for many years and a wonderful teacher at Weston years ago. And uh, thanks to you too, Bob, for your introduction. Uh, this is really an honor for me to be here. It's like coming home in a way, but coming home to a new and beautiful place. So I'm delighted to be uh, invited. And I, I want to thank uh, Karen Kiefer, especially, and Paul Wendell for their wonderful uh, communications that made everything very easy to, to be here. The assignment that I was given, however, is something else, If when you consider that it is to be done in about a half an hour, uh, simply to talk about seminaries as they are today, have been in the past, and will be in the future. <laughs> so other than that, um, I won't talk about too much else. And so in uh, doing this tonight, um, I will uh, do it in several stages. First of all, in a sort of a skeletal way, uh, talk about the collection of schools about which I'm speaking, the enrollment patterns, and the uh, faculty shifts that have happened in the last uh, number of years. So that's uh, kind of to set the stage. Uh, secondly, a part of the assignment was to speak of this in light of what's happening in the church today. And so I will mention several broader ecclesial and societal uh, issues and contexts that have affected seminary education and formation, or that should affect it very much in the future. Then getting more into the heart of the matter, I will examine uh, the seminaries for what they have tried to do so far in the direct response to the way the church has changed and other forces of such as the church directives that have been plentiful in recent years about how seminaries should be. And then finally, I will suggest a few modifications and considerations that seem to me to be important if we are to be faithful to the gospel message of preparing people to go out to all the world and spread the good news. So that's the agenda for tonight. And it will uh, take uh, some quick work in order to get through some of this. But know that at the end, there will be time for questions so that you can uh, delve into areas that may, might be of great interest. Um, the handout that you received, um, I won't be referring to things in detail, but it might be worthwhile for you to just have those uh, handouts on hand, and I'll refer to them as, as we move along. So the first page refers to the models of seminary and uh, to the numbers of them, just to give a quick historical account. In 1967, more or less at the peak, there were 110 theologates, major seminaries. And when I'm speaking here of seminaries, I'll be talking only about the theolo theological level, not about college or high school seminaries. So just to keep that in mind. By the mid-1970s, uh, not that many years later, there were only about 70 seminaries. And the ones that closed were largely religious order schools. About 40 small theologates closed in favor of a few centers, the Catholic Theological Union and Washington Theological Union took in many of those religious communities. And a few special ones like the Jesuits and the Dominicans and a few others kept their own schools. And that pattern continues until today. So from 110 at the present time, as you will see on that sheet, there are now 46 seminaries that are still functioning. 
And of these, uh, 24 are in the first column, mainly independent diocesan schools. The middle section has grown, and these are university-related schools. And of course, Weston is one of the places where it has uh, changed from uh, being an independent school to be part of Boston College to its great advantage. And uh, also now uh, in Berkeley, and a few other schools have moved, moved toward universities. So that's a rather major shift. The last column is a variety of, of ways in which seminaries have organized themselves. So this gives you the total layout of the schools that we're talking about, 46. And uh, that's, that's the, uh, the grouping. The second piece that we'll um, want to have in the back of our minds as we hear some of the other uh, topics is the uh, current in, uh, the enrollment and how that um, has changed through the years. That's the second sheet if you uh, want to turn over to, uh, to that sheet. Amazingly enough, the first time that a comprehensive uh, view of how many seminarians were actually in studying for uh, in theological schools was in 1967. Um, in that year, there were about uh, eight, over 8,000 theologians. Only two years later, there were 6,600, and that's where your table starts here. I wanted to get the 70, 75, and so on down the line. In no time, it dropped to only 500, five years later, uh, 5,000 rather, and then to 4,000, and somewhat stabilized, then to 3,000. And it's somewhat stabilized around that number um, at, at this point. The only other thing that, uh, two things that happened in the meantime. One, um, since seminarians were coming at an older age and were not really suited to go to, uh, back to college, uh, a program called pre-theology was started. And this was an opportunity for those who had a college degree but had not studied philosophy and theology to study a lot of philosophy and a little bit of theology to prepare in order to be ready to study theology full time. So that pre-theology program was begun around that time. And as you see, it grew tremendously. And at uh, the current time, it's over 800 uh, 820 students are in the pre-theology program. This makes the total enrollment look pretty good because those students are added into the theology enrollments now. But if we took those out, they're almost all diocesan. If we took them out, there would only be about 1,800 diocesan seminarians in theology and about 800 religious order. Right at this point, I have it shaded because it's a low point for um, religious order seminarians. There are just very few in numbers, and that's a troubling feature. The uh, low point for the uh, diocesan seminarians was actually a few years before. It had been gradually increasing their numbers, but then uh, after the sexual abuse crisis there, was a crisis, there was a sudden drop within about two years, uh, over a drop of over 600 in all of the, in, across the board in seminaries. That was a tremendous loss, and we have not yet fully recovered from that particular thing. So what we're seeing then, if you look at the bottom line, the difference, taking the first early period and the later period, it's all minuses except for, of course, that new program that was added. So we're dealing really with very uh, much fewer students. There's only one person being ordained for every three priests who are retiring or dying or uh, leaving the priesthood at this point. So the uh, future in that sense is very uh, troubling and will affect the way priests need to be trained because it's a whole different uh, scene that we are looking at. So um, the, meanwhile, the, the other major feature that happened is lay students began enrolling in the early 1970s. And the numbers by the, the uh, early 80s was in the range of 2,300 lay students across the board. It, uh, more were in diocesan seminaries at that point than in religious order seminaries. That has changed. The number has not grown very much at all, only 2,700 now. So it's only grown about 400 in these 25 years. And uh, now it's about equally divided between religious order and diocesan seminaries. The ones in diocesan seminaries are by and large separated from seminarians in separate programs. In religious order schools, they tend to be uh, studying together. So that's another important difference. Moving on, um, 
we also have the influx of large numbers of international students. Uh, 20 or so years ago, they weren't even separately counted, but we estimate that maybe 5% were international. At the present time, 25% are from international schools or, or internationally uh, attending uh, seminaries in the United States. So we have a picture that is fairly um, concerning in terms of numbers, but we do the best we can with what we have, and we'll see some of the adjustments that the church has made in that regard. Most of these young students nowadays have lived their adult lives during the pontificate of uh, Pope John Paul II, and uh, it, is, it explains their outlook on the church, I think, very uh, well. And uh, so it's uh, different from probably most of the people in the audience here today in terms of their experience of church, quite different. So faculty have uh, the very great challenge of dealing with uh, students who are of another generation by and large. In the next handout, we'll only look at that briefly, that's the current status. It gives the number of pre-sisters and brothers, uh, laymen and laywomen, um, and in, with their degrees and also um, with obviously their vocational status. The sheet following, you can ask questions about that later if you'd like, is a summary that gives us a little historical overview. The, uh, there are immense changes that are happening uh, right at this time within the last few years actually in terms of the uh, um, who constitutes the faculties. Uh, the proportion of priests has declined from 76% in the earlier period, the earliest that I have a record of, 1985, to uh, 57% now. So that is a loss of almost um, 20% in the proportion of priests. They are being replaced by lay men especially, somewhat more lay women, and of course fewer lay uh, sisters because of uh, the drop in the number of sisters. So we see a very great difference in the constitution of the uh, faculty in terms of vocation. In terms of degree, there has been less change except from the first period when there were about 64% who had doctoral degrees. It's now about 10% more, but it's leveled off at that level. And the rest have uh, uh, degrees that are of a lower status. Um, and the schools from which they uh, have received these degrees is interesting too. Um, fewer, 11% fewer are studying in Europe and that means the rest are studying in the United States now, and about 6% fewer in Rome. Part of the reason for that is so many of the religious who might have studied there are now retiring, and so uh, they were the ones who taught in those 40 or so schools that closed, and now they're at a retirement age. So we have a very different uh, constituent of, of faculty at this point. There's a lot more to say about that, but for now I'll have to leave it right there, and if you have questions, we can come back to that. There's been a, a great interest on the part of uh, some of the uh, church leaders to have more people earn their doctorate uh, from um, a pontifical degree, and yet only about 30% of the faculty have their highest degree as a, an ST, uh, STD as a pontifical degree. More have an STL, but it's by no means what the church had expected, and it doesn't look like it's going to head in that uh, direction too much. So that's a little bit inside the seminary. Quickly, I'll move to the, the uh, outside of the seminary. What are some of the major trends in the church that are affecting seminaries? I'll only mention three, and I'll do it as uh, expeditiously as I can. I'll talk about changes in the Catholic population, and I'll talk about changes in church personnel and the roles of priests, and then changes in the behaviors and attitudes of Catholics all of which have a great impact on how uh, people need to be educated for ministry today. So uh, you can turn the page to the next one for in terms of the Catholic population. I won't dwell on this, but over the past 40 or so years, um, there are more than 20 million Catholics than there were 40 years ago. So we have a huge number more Catholics than we've ever had. Most of it is due to immigration. So we have a very different, uh, our population in the Catholic Church is constituted very differently than in the past. About half of Catholics now are 
of what we call minorities, but exactly they're actually becoming uh, the Anglo European Anglo Catholics are becoming the minority. As a matter of fact, it's about evenly divided at this point, and in this way, nearly forty percent um, are uh, Hispanic uh, of Hispanic background. At least twenty-seven million people, many of them new immigrants. About four and a half percent each of African Americans and Asian of a wide variety, including the Pacific Islanders, the Philippines, and so on. So that's another 9%, and then about 1% are Native Americans. So there we have about 50%. Um, the, we need to, uh, in, in seminaries, direct our studies in a very different way in order to accommodate that quite distinctive group of Catholics that's quite different from what we've originally had. Um, there are other changes within the church. Uh, the movement of the population is important. Movement from rural to urban and suburban areas. This has meant that many of the rural churches that were once staffed by a single priest are now being combined. So this phenomenon of multiple parish ministry of many of the diocesan priests, and incidentally 15% of those in multiple parishes are religious, so it's not totally diocesan. But uh, there are so many parishes now, about half of all the parishes in the United States are in a situation where the priest is, has at least another parish. And of all the priests, most of them are doing a second job of some kind or another, even if they're in a large urban or suburban parish. And sometimes the urban parishes are being combined too, and one priest has two or three parishes. The other movement that's important is from the north and northeast to the south and southwest. This relocation is disruptive in that the personnel, program, services, and facilities are not where the Catholics are in great numbers. The Catholic infrastructure is simply not available where Catholics are located. There's a need to respond to those shifts in population and to the places where these particular uh, Catholics are located that need more services. Uh, the second broad area that I would like to refer to is the change in church personnel and the role of priests and church structures. I don't know what the sound effect is there, but... I don't think it's okay, but they need it for the recording, so yeah. Anyway, we'll go on, and I hopefully the uh, sound will be okay. Uh, so the church personnel, looking still at the same sheet, what we notice uh, very quickly is that um, the uh, personnel is very different. There are t almost twenty thousand fewer priests, and of course, a hundred and eighteen thousand fewer sisters. So we're looking at person, church personnel at this point. And um, we've noted the uh, uh, number of priests has dropped by almost 20,000, 19,000 and some. Um, even though the base was smaller for religious, the proportion of those who have, the numbers have gone down considerably of great concern. Number of sisters is considerably less, brothers as well. So who is replacing all of these ministers in the church? Well, the gap is being filled by two sets of people. Permanent deacons restored in the 1970s, now they number over 17,000. And they're doing functions of all kinds, depending a lot on the part of the country, the diocese, and so on. But what's really made a big difference is the way lay ecclesial ministries ministers have stepped up to take the place of so many, of, especially of sisters and, and brothers, uh, over 30,000, and these numbers are kind of generalized because um, there isn't as careful a count kept of lay ministers as there is of priests and sisters. However, that may change in the future. So at least 30,000 are working uh, for pay and uh, nearly full-time or full-time in parishes. An additional 162,000 or so are working in the schools. So we can imagine that they've more or less taken the place of the vast majority of sisters who were in those situations. And so we have those two groups of people who have stepped up and really uh, helped to fill in in a very important way in the ministry of the church. So in terms of seminaries, of course, uh, learning to work together with a different group of people 
is one of the essential pieces of training, of formation, that will be needed, in, especially in the future. So there is some resistance to working together at times, and so it's a great task to try to overcome that resistance in the, in the future. The third area of, of changes in the church are in the behaviors and attitudes of um, Catholics. And your next page will give you some data on that. Catholics are different not only from what they were in the past, but are very different from each other in profound ways. Uh, Catholics, for example, hold sharply different opinions on moral and social issues, uh, sometimes on the identification that they have with church authority. Uh, they accept it to ver in varying degrees, uh, the guiding force of the church teachings. Some take these decisions into their own hands. Liturgical and devotional preferences also divide parishes and, and people in many different ways. It's really a different ecclesiology and one that is less and less influenced by Vatican II as time passes. So these are some changes in attitudes and they come about largely because of generational shifts, which you will see on the sheet indicated here. Uh, there are a couple of things to look at um, on that sheet. First of all, on the right-hand side, I like to notice that uh, in 1987, 80, 78% of Catholics had lived through Vatican II. Now, or in 2005, it was about 52%, and now it's less than 45%. So less than half of Catholics actually understood and lived through Vatican II. Therefore, its importance in the minds of those Catholics varies tremendously. And teaching seminaries in seminaries nowadays has the great challenge of trying to uh, emphasize that a, a, that a council is a very important part of the church's history, and it's not something to be disregarded after a few 40 or 50 years. So that's one of the major things to notice in this uh, uh, chart. The other is the identification of different age groups with the Catholic Church. What is most astounding is the millennials, who would now be somewhere in the ages of, um, let's say, approximately 20 to 30 years old. They um, only 7% say that they are highly committed to the church. And this would be an answer to questions like, being Catholic is a very important part of who I am. I would really want my children to be raised as Catholics. There is uh, nothing about the church that really is difficult for me that completely committed a very small proportion of the youngest generation. Interestingly, those who are uh, entering um, seminaries are very often in that group, and so they're quite different from their peers. Half of that age group has almost no identification with the church and doesn't particularly want to have an identification. They don't see things the way their leaders of, of their own age are, are understanding the church. So that's something to note. There are other things that could be said about that and some other notes there. But the great divergence or differences among Catholics and the challenge that that poses for seminary education is there. One of the resulting things of all of this is that church attendance is down. And the uh, Pew study reported that um, about a fourth of all Catholics who were raised Catholic are no longer in the Catholic Church. So these are uh, evangel uh, evangelization challenges that are certainly there. Now to the heart of the matter, what are seminaries doing with this and about this? We just have uh, two more sheets that go together as far as handouts, so you can have those standing by. Um, changes in theological formation programs have been initiated over the years by the Pope, uh, especially John Paul II, in a wonderful document called Pastoris Dabo Vobis, uh, pretty much acknowledged, I will give you shepherds in 1992, to be one of the great and important uh, descriptions of what a seminary should be like. And bishops have also asked for changes as they see uh, necessary. Vocation directors pick seminaries according to their desire for a certain kind of ecclesiology that is present in that seminary. And the same might be said for religious orders as well. Among the seminaries themselves, there are different levels of awareness of parochial life or of the other ministries in the church. 
and what kind of response is needed today. Some pay a great deal of attention to that. Others pretty much follow along with uh, directives without a lot of um, further thought about it. But there have been some modifications over the years in mission statements, in um, the ecclesiological understandings of themselves and their role with lay people. The tendency has been for religious to come more closely to working together with lay people in the diocesan schools to separate the lay students from the priesthood students. Um, in terms of human formation, there's been a great deal of development around celibate chastity. I'll say more about that in a moment. Spiritual formation, the second of four pillars of formation, as they are called. Um, there's been a great change in the style and variety of spiritual exercises. And the third, in terms of intellectual formation, the academic for focus of courses and the way they are taught has changed in recent years. Finally, pastoral formation, the settings, and the extent of ministerial experience is also changed. So let's look at each of those. Um, the first, we'll do it in terms of sets. Human and spiritual formation go together in many different ways. These are two areas that used to be treated as one, that uh, the spiritual life was to take into account human formation. The truth of the matter very, was that very little was done about human formation in the ways that we would understand development today. Um, in Pope uh, John Paul's document um, on seminaries, he insisted that there be uh, this fourth pillar called human formation. And he was describing the development that a person needed to experience before they came into seminary in terms of their spiritual life, in terms of their relationships with their families and other people, uh, just simply in, in growing up as a human person and understanding themselves first as human and then as a spiritual person with those human characteristics. Uh, since the uh, uh, sexual abuse scandals uh, broke in uh, 2002, um, the, those programs have been really scrutinized. Although in 1992 the Pope asked for some of these changes, many seminaries did very little until kind of the present to make those programs fuller than they, than they used to be in, in terms of, of explaining sexuality and celibacy and some of those issues, both from a spiritual and from a human point of view. So that's been an enormous change that's still underway. Uh, deficiencies have been identified and programs are still being implemented that make some difference in terms of preparation. One of the concerns that has arisen in the last few years that I've heard expressed by a number of bishops and others is that um, the ways of dealing with celibacy in the view of many is that it is places too much emphasis still on the spiritual dimensions of living a chaste celibate life with little attention given to the realities and difficulties encountered every day in living as a celibate priest. So there still needs to be some shifts in those programs, even though much of it has happened. In the work that I have done with the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, as Dick mentioned, um, we looked at the sexual abuse crisis from many points of view. And one of the things I did was to go back over the five different uh, programs of priestly formation that the bishops put out. The first three had three short paragraphs about celibacy, it said almost nothing, and it was in terms of celibacy so that the priest could be more available for ministry. Only in 1992, uh, after the Pope's document, was there a longer description, and finally, in 2006, is it fully described as to what should be included in these programs. So that's a big shift takes place mostly in diocesan schools because this area of formation is largely cared for by the religious communities in their communities rather than in the schools of theology. So that's really important. In terms of the intellectual and pastoral formation, um, there have been a couple of changes of, of note. Three additional courses, nine credits approximately, have been added. That's on the last page of your um, handout here, and then all of the courses that are required and the, how they've changed are on the other columns there. But you can see there are about nine credits more that amounts to about three courses additional to what used to be. And of these, one that was required is um, the theology of priesthood or celibacy or priesthood and holy orders or some title like that. 
So that became a new course that was added. And a second area of new studies that has been re-emphasized is that relating to Hispanic studies. And uh, Spanish language, perhaps, learning to preach in Spanish and learning to minister in Hispanic communities. So those are some of the uh, changes. From year to year, looking through the catalogs, which I've done now for about 25 or 30 years, the casual observer may detect little, few changes. But when we look at uh, the cumulative effects of the adaptations, some might call it a sea change. So uh, what, is, what are some of those sea changes that I would identify? I already mentioned that the focus on Vatican II is slipping into the background in many places, and a much more apologetic approach is being taken in a number of schools with privileged place given to the works of Thomas Aquinas. Um, another kind of adaptation is the highlighting of priestly identity and ministry and spirituality in contrast to the broader ecclesiological context that includes all of the faithful. And then the third shift is in terms of uh, moral theology courses that tend to focus even more on sexual morality and biomedical ethics and less on the broader social teachings of the church. So these are some of the areas that have changed and that some would find uh, not to be quite in tune with some of the needs of the church. So let us then look at what kinds of modifications are still needed in conclusion here. The, um, what I call the remedies and modifications, I think, are uh, about four. First is understanding the context of ministry. Um, broadly, this means to be able to uh, accept the reality of diversity and to work with that. It means approaching the cultural variations and the theological variations that we find um, with uh, an understanding of where, where people are coming from in terms of their beliefs and their attitudes. Another would be uh, to look at some of the uh, liturgical differences, the spiritual experiences that are represented from other cultures that need to be incorporated and understood clearly by those who are ministering to these people. It includes a, a thorough understanding of the essence and the fullness of the Catholic tradition. So we need to understand the whole tradition, not just the uh, version that we happen to have grown up with. A third task is uh, practicing the art of social analysis, which I think means that we need to base decisions on the reality of what exists and not on the per personal preferences of those who are doing the ministry, but it's for the common good. Sensitive approaches in the use of authority will make these uh, ministries much more effective. And then finally, we need to equip individuals both spiritually and intellectually so that they can take into account the global context, the care of the poor, social justice, war and peace, things that touch every parish. We are the world in a certain sense. We have the world in our backyard, taking into account what's happened, for example, lately in Japan, in Australia, in uh, New Zealand, so many places in the world. The goal is to attend to all of the people with uh, grace and with the hope for salvation for all, won by the life, death, and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. So we accept the uh, reality of diversity and incorporate recognition of cultural needs. We accept the reality of theological differences and we take into account the fullness of the Catholic tradition, balanced and inclusive of all. It's a big tent that we live in uh, to include about a billion and some people. We need to widen the spaces of our tents. And then we need to provide accurate analysis of pastoral needs and respond appropriately. And we need spiritual deepening and conversion so that we have the ability to inspire and encourage. And the seminary, it seems to me, is the focal point for inculcating virtues and values that convey a sense of hope and expectation for improvement to the church, the world, and every individual living in it. Thank you. Thank you.